Good morning, good morning. Happy New Year. Awesome, we're here, we're alive, we're awake. Welcome here, church. My name is Jason Clausen, and I'm pastor here at the Open Door, and I'm just glad you guys could join us in this new year. And I know technically we did have church together as a family once already in the new year, but none of you were here. I was here. There was like 30 of us. No, that's not quite entirely true. So I'm glad you guys could be here. Uh, uh, I'm excited today. I'm actually curious how many of you made New Year's resolutions. A couple. You guys are not a resolution-making church, eh? Pretty happy with who you are. Status quo is treating you well, yeah? I never make New Year's resolutions personally, but I'm, I'm fascinated by them for a couple of reasons. Um, one, because, I mean, sort of January 1st seems like an arbitrary time to make resolutions. I mean, if there's an issue in your life you want to change, you can do that any time. But also, I'm fascinated with it because of how horrible we are as humanity at New Year's resolutions. We are absolutely abysmal at New Year's resolutions. If you resolved, or if you know somebody who resolved to quit smoking this year, they got a 7.7% chance of succeeding. That is dismal. That is absolutely dismal. Now, if you resolve to lose weight, that number just dropped to 5.5%. You got a better chance of quitting smoking than losing weight, just saying. We got the Daniel plan thing advertised in the back of the bulletin, 5.5% chance, guys. If you resolved this year to learn a new language or learn a new instrument on your own, to take it up and to just really get in there and learn, you just dropped a 5.3% chance of success. This is how bad we are as a culture at actually succeeding in our New Year's resolutions. In fact, half of you, statistically, half of you sitting here today have never, never, never once succeeded in any of your New Year's resolutions, ever. Half of you. So which half of you? Can you raise your hand? Uh, I got one hand. Now, if you're over 50, you're super old, you're over 50 like Gavin. He's not over 50? You sure? He looks over 50. Really? He's really far away from me, but I I know he still has his army training, so I'm scared about how close he can, how quick he can close the distance. If you're over 50, you will statistically have a 16% chance of succeeding at resolution. So basically the 20, 30, 40 year olds are like really boosting those numbers to half. We're terrible. We, we never succeeded in our New Year's resolutions. We, it's, it's hard. And I think part of the reason why it's so hard is because a year is a long time. It's a lot of time. So I think we need to look today at a shorter time frame, something a little smaller, like a millisecond. That's short, right? How, how long is a millisecond? Does anybody here know how long a millisecond is? One thousandth of a second. That's fantastic. Way to go. That's how long a millisecond is. How long is that? Well, it's nothing. It's, in fact, we sometimes say, um, uh, I'll be there in a heartbeat. At rest, your heart beats 860 milliseconds. 860 of them. That's a lot. 860 milliseconds. I mean, just imagine what you could do if you were living on the millisecond time scale. Um, if you... Oh, man. Yeah, 860 milliseconds is also a blink of an eye. Man, a blink of an eye is going to slow you down to about three to 400 milliseconds. Just a blink of an eye. Three, 400. Just, just blink, I know you're just blinking. And just count it. 300 milliseconds of your life gone. 300 milliseconds. Just so much time. A jiffy. Be there in a jiffy. Apparently, that's 10 milliseconds. You will not be there in a jiffy. I'll tell you that much. Ten mil- if you are going in a millisecond time scale, one millisecond, if you're traveling at 100 miles per hour down a road in one millisecond, you go two inches forward. This is really fast. In fact, there's a billion milliseconds, approximately, just a little over a billion milliseconds in a year. That's why your resolutions fail. They have to survive one billion millisecond tests. You're never going to succeed. Now, here's something that I find interesting. From the time you think a thought, let's say, I want to move my finger, I want to move my finger. That feels instantaneous, right? I think, I want to move my finger, I'm going to move my fingers. It takes about 200 milliseconds for your brain to make the thought, pass it down through the spine, down the nerves of your arm, through your wrist, to your finger. It takes about 200 milliseconds, about a fifth of a second from when I think, I'm going to move my finger, till I move my finger. Now, that's interesting. And I think the secret to why our New Year's resolutions fail is in that time difference, in that lag time. 
200 milliseconds. Imagine if you're trying to throw a pitch. You're a pitcher and you're trying to throw a pitch. Now, when, you, when you're standing, it's about 62, 65 feet back that the, the pitcher's mound is from, the, from the, the batter, from the plate. So if you throw a pitch and you're throwing a really fast pitch, the difference between hitting the strike zone on your release and missing is a release of plus or minus half a millisecond. That's really, really precise. But, but imagine this, imagine this. If you're a pitcher and it takes you 200 milliseconds from the time you think the thought till your hand moves, how can you hope to release the ball at the right time plus or minus half a millisecond? It's absolutely bizarre. See, what happens is our brain has become, our, our human brain is really good at using the past to figure out the present. See, you're not actually living in the present. You think you see me where I am, but you don't. You see, because by the time the light hits my, my shirt, my nice Christmas sweater, that's right, by the time the light hits my Christmas sweater, bounces off of it, hits your eyes, your eyes process that light, send a signal to your brain, your brain processes the visual imagery and sends a signal down to your arm, 200 milliseconds has passed. You're a fifth of a second late. And that might sound really quick, but if I'm throwing a baseball at your face, a fifth of a millisecond is a pretty big difference. Or a fifth of a second is a pretty big difference. So your brain is getting pretty good at saying, oh, he's moving this direction. And he's moving in this direction. Okay, I've got a couple of images of a, of a guy or a ball or a car moving in a certain direction. The brain knows it's about a few milliseconds behind. And it fills in what must have happened in that time frame. Are you, are you following me? So, so if you're a batter and you're watching a ball come at you from the pitcher's mound, you see a ball. You see the ball closer. You see the ball closer. And even though the ball is already past the plate, and the batter has only seen the ball, our brain has only processed the imagery of the ball halfway to the plate, the batter is able to swing and time it with the ball because your brain's guessing where the ball will have been by the time you start swinging. This is crazy. Who here likes Dude Perfect? Have you ever seen the YouTube channel Dude Perfect? You guys are hilarious. You should watch that. They have this thing where they'll, do, they'll, they'll sink crazy basket shots. They got basketball, they got baskets, like 20-story like throws and they sink baskets and whatever. But they do one that I think is really interesting. They put a basket on a truck and they're driving like 60 miles an hour. And the guy will just huck the basket and just swish, perfect swish. But if he throws it where the basket is when he's letting go, he's going to miss by like 100 feet. So what he does is he throws way ahead of where the truck is, and it drives into where the basket is. I mean, that makes sense, right? That's what you'd have to do. That's what your brain is doing all the time. If you're a, if you're a pitcher, your brain says, okay, let go now. But of course, you're not supposed to let go now. And the signal travels down, travels down, travels down, and boom, you let go at the exact perfect time. I don't. I mean, in theory, people do. I let go at horribly wrong time, and it never hits the strike zone, but that's my problem. Our brain is really, really good at living in the past to help you understand the present to be able to act into the future. Our brain's really good. And those 200 milliseconds are processed really well by the brain. Except when they're not. Our brain is living in the past. But sometimes our brain gets stuck in the past. See, when our brain has a misunderstanding, a misassociation, a misrepresentation of the past, and it's using the past to help you understand the present, to live into the future, if you've got a misunderstanding in the past, then it doesn't matter how well, how hard you work on your present, you're always guessing wrong about the future. If I'm a batter, and I maybe get four or five clear images of a baseball, here, 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 and I'm standing on that end of the stage, and i got to swing... If one of my images is wrong, if one of my images says the ball's way off to the side and then it's in line, I'm going to swing like it's way off to my other side. Right? I only have a few, few brief moments, a few brief images to make, a, to make a guess about what the future will hold. If my basic assumptions about the past are wrong, it doesn't matter how well, how accurately I try to live into the present, I'm making wrong assumptions about my future. Are you tracking with me here on this? Our brain might be living in the past, but some of us are stuck in our past. And we let our past or our misunderstandings of the past define us, carry with us. Whether it's things we've done in the past, things done to us about the past, labels we've been given, labels we've given ourselves. 
sin, guilt, shame, worry, fear in the past, doesn't matter how well you're doing in the present, you're going to make misunderstandings and misguesses about your future. Have you ever had an opportunity? Or have you ever wanted to have an opportunity to do something right now for yourself, but you've stayed away or you've shied away because of your past? We all have. I mean, this isn't even like a have you ever question. This is rhetorical. We all have. There's stuff that we haven't done or haven't chosen to do or haven't pursued because of stuff that's happened in our past, things we maybe feel we're disqualified for by our own actions, actions done to us, doesn't matter what it is. We've stayed away from certain opportunities, certain actions, certain goals. One of the biggest um, things you can do to increase the chance of, of, of achieving a New Year's resolution is um, to not say things like, I run sometimes. I run sometimes. Yeah, I, I go running some. The biggest thing you can do to boost your, or one of the biggest things you can do to boost your chances is to say, I am a runner, even if you don't run. I, am, I define myself as a runner. This is, this is who I am. This is a part of who I am. Even if you haven't run, even if you failed last year at your goal to run or lose weight or whatever. To let it define you in your present. But to do this well, to do this understand, to actually allow whatever your goals are to, to drift into your soul, you have to have an understanding of your past. We spend a lot of time working on our present and a lot of time dreaming about and hoping about and planning our future. But if we don't have a healthy, proper, and godly understanding of our past, we can't live into our future the way we want to. It's, it's just a fact. And for a lot of us, it's family history stuff, stuff that's happened in our family, our lineage. Some people call it generational cursing. Some people call it genetic predispositions. Some people, you, you'll see all sorts of terminology. But there's a lot of stuff about our past, about our family past, that we tend to believe will define us. And we can let it define us. We, we can actually speak that into defining us. But the reality is, God's made you. He's made you for a plan and a purpose. And his cross and his death and his resurrection is enough for you. And if you let that be enough for you, that can be your past to define your present, to live into the future. Our brain is living in the past, but you don't have to be stuck in living out of the past. Isaiah 43, 25. God says it as clearly as, uh, Isaiah said through God, as clearly as possible. It is I who sweep away your transgressions for my own sake. And somebody here, some of you here need to hear that. Not for your sake. You didn't earn it. I'm not saying you're worthy. For God's sake, he sweeps away your transgressions and remembers your sins no more. Makes you new. New Testament, author in Hebrews, repeats the same idea. He says, therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, since we're, since we're surrounded by the great saints and believers and the heavenly hosts around us, since we are surrounded and steeped in this, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us. It is a lot harder to run a race with weight on you than without. I think this is pretty obvious. Uh, uh, professional sprinters will literally shave fractions of ounces off of their running gear, their shoes, or their, or their, um, um, their running, yeah, running wear in the hopes of carrying less weight with them as they run. But how many of you are carrying baggage from the past, trying to live well in the present to understand your future? Look, we're entering a new year, and, and I mean, I just said I don't do a lot of New Year's resolutions, but there's a sense, I think, in many people that in a new year, you take stock. You take stock of your last year, and maybe you look forward and try to plan some things in your new year. Whether or not it's a resolution specifically, most people do this. This is a new year, a fresh chance to look at new opportunities for yourself. And I want to challenge you, church, this year to let God define who you're supposed to be in 2017. You might have been on a track for a very long time, maybe even a positive track, a generally positive track, maybe a negative track, maybe you've an up and down track where you've never been able to be consistent in what you're doing. I don't know, you, you've been on a track for a while, but 2017 doesn't have to be another leg on the existing track. God can do transformational miracles. God can do different things in your life. God gets to define who you are. 
And I bet you God's already put a dream, a design, a goal in you. If God's doing something in your life that's different than what's happened in the past, happened in your family, maybe different than what other people define you're capable of, I want, I want you to consider actually pursuing it. Not letting your past define your present as you live into the future. You don't have to be stuck living out of your past. You, you can change that. You can actually make a break from that. Not on your own. Goodness, no, not on your own. I mean, for goodness sakes, we have a 7.7% chance of quitting smoking. You don't have a chance of living a completely different life on your own. But you're not on your own. God's spirit is in you. You're surrounded right now by a family of believers who will walk with you. You have hope and you have God's word spilling in you and through you. God can do a new thing in your life. What are you capable of? Man, I love this, this verse in 2 Corinthians 5. It's so clear. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, so if you're in Christ, you're a new creation. Old things have passed away. They're, they're dead. Old things are dead. And look, new things have come. There's, there's new growth. There's, there's new chances. There's new opportunity. Everything is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. He made you right with Christ and gave you the ministry. Gave you, if you're sitting here today, gave you a ministry to help others reconcile to God as well. To share the news that we can be reconciled. We can be new creations. That is, in Christ... God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting your screw-ups against you. And he has committed the message of reconciliation to us. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, certain that God is appealing through us. We plead on Christ's behalf. Right now, this morning, I'm pleading on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. He made the one who did not know sin, that's Jesus, to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 2017, you can live like the righteousness of God in Jesus. Blows my mind. It's a mystery how that works, but I'm telling you it's true. We read it right here in the Bible in plain talk. When we talk about forgiveness and not counting our trespasses against you, well, we don't say that actually. I have never said to somebody who said, they said sorry to me, I said, Worry not. I count not your trespasses against you. I've never said that to anybody. When we say I forgive you, we generally mean I, I just won't think about it a whole lot. Or I want this conversation to be over so I'll say I forgive you so you go away and I can be bitter quietly by myself. Whichever one you're feeling. God's version of forgiveness is different. God's version of forgiveness is pretty dramatic. Um, and I, I want to level with you, church. I live... Attacked by doubt. You, you, I don't know, some people might guess it, some people might not. Most people wouldn't guess it, I don't think. I live attacked by doubt. I don't live in doubt. I don't live in doubt at all. I live attacked by doubt. I live virtually every moment of my life with the devil trying to attack me with doubt. That I'm not worthy. I mean... Goodness knows, I know all week, I know for six and a half days of the week that I'm going to come here and stand up in front of you and, and bring a ministry of reconciliation as an ambassador of Christ. And, and I live every moment, and not long before I even was a pastor, uh, attacked by doubt that I'm not worthy to do that, that I didn't live my life well enough, that I'm, a, I'm not a first-rate Christian, I'm a third-rate Christian, that there's stuff in my life that disqualifies me, that the way I lived my week wasn't holy or whatever. I can remember pretty much every bad thing I have done, and, and, and they want to come to me. I live attacked by doubt, but I don't have to live in doubt. My brain remembers the past, but I don't have to live out of my past. See, what happens is, every morning I wake up, and it doesn't take very long for the first doubt to attack me. And then, and then what I say is, well, yeah, that's, that's true. I, I did that, or I lived like that, or I probably will live like that, or, you know, that's probably true but I'm not trying to do this in my own strength. I'm not trying to live holy enough that I'm worthy to do this. I'm going to trust when God says, Jason, I've forgiven you. You're my son. I'll work in you. Listen to my words. Be filled with my spirit and do what I've called you to do. Nothing more, nothing less. 
I go, you know what, God? I'll take you at face value. It's like I stand at the edge of a cliff every morning, and I hear doubts, and I say, you know what? Screw doubts. I'm jumping. And I bet you God's going to catch me. And, and you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't always used to jump big jumps. I jumped little jumps. And you know what? God caught me. So I jumped a little bit of a bigger jump. It builds faith when you trust that God actually is reconciling. It builds faith when you say, you know what, God? My past doesn't have to define me. I'm going to let you define my present. I'm going to live how you've called me to live. I'm going to jump. And God catches you. So I don't come here telling you you can live different because I have some great story of how I live different. I'm telling you you can live different. You can succeed. You can grow not because God's forgiving you transgressions for your sake, but for his sake. I'm not saying you're capable. I'm saying God's capable. I've seen transformations. There's some people here who really need to hear this. I spend a lot of time praying about the word God has for, for the open door, for myself, for you guys, for small groups, for whatever. And I just really feel like 2017, God's been saying... To you guys, church, you're not defined by your past, good or bad. You're defined by who I am right now. God never says, I am the I was, or I am the I will be. He says, I am that I am. I'm doing something right now, in this moment. And if we let our past define ourselves, we'll miss who God is right now to us. Um, somebody wants to find uh, forgiveness as God performing a miracle in the past. Whatever happened was real. And then, and then we moved on. And that real thing stayed there dogging us. Maybe something we did, something somebody did to us, whatever. Forgiveness of sins is God going back in time and performing a miracle and healing that back in time. Not that you don't have scars. But your scars become a beautiful testimony of God's healing. When God talks about forgiveness, he's talking about something radical. Not I forget, I choose to forget, or I'll look the other way or in a different corner or whatever. It says in, in, in the Psalms, it says, for, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his faithful love towards those who fear him. And as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. That is to say, they don't exist anymore. They're done. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Look, it's done. It's buried. It's gone. You're a new creation. The old has been made new. So many of us, so many Christians are ashamed of what they've done, who they are, how they've been defined, how they've lived in the past, that they're ashamed of their own testimonies, that we just hide as third-rate Christians and hope nobody notices us. We'll sneak into heaven quietly and be done with this whole thing. The Bible talks so many times about how approved workmen are not to be ashamed and that we should never be ashamed of our testimony and we should never be ashamed of being persecuted for the Lord Jesus Christ because the reality is your testimony is beautiful as a work of reconciliation of your past through the present to what God's doing in you. Your ministry isn't look how great you lived your life. Your ministry is look how faithful God is. It's a ministry of reconciliation. It's a ministry of forgiveness. It says right here, there's a ministry of forgiveness. So if your past is really messy, you're kind of lucky because you've got a greater ministry of reconciliation. And you don't have to wait till you have a I once was lost but now am found testimony. I, I, I'll say that, I say this frequently if you, if you hang around with me. You've heard me say this. I don't trust I once was lost but now I'm found testimonies because none of us are really all that found. I love I once was lost, but through God I'm getting somewhere. I once was lost, but God loves me testimonies. I love those kinds of testimonies because they're real. I trust those. Look, I once was lost. God loves me. I hope I'm more found than I once was, and I hope in 10 years I'm more found than I am right now. But you know what? God loves me, and there's no such thing as a third-rate Christian. Because being a Christian isn't something in you. It's God working through you. So there's no such thing as a third-rate, second-rate, first-rate Christian. Well, I'm a really holy Christian. 
I didn't screw up for like eight and a half days. It doesn't exist. There's just people who let God work in them. There's just people who trust God with their lives and people who don't. And if you're one of the people who lets God work in your life, who trusts God, you now have a ministry of reconciliation to those who don't. That God is real and he loves and he saves and he cares and he's making old things new and he's bringing a new creation. And he started it in you and that's your ministry. That's your testimony. That's your 2017. How is being stuck in the past hurting your present? How is living out of the past hurting your opportunity to serve God right now in the present? Here's a question I want to leave with you. What is one thing you can do alongside God this year? What is one thing you can do alongside God this year that your past shouldn't let you do? But I believe God's prompting you to do. What is one thing your past should disqualify you from that God can grow you into. That's a doozy. What's something you know in your own strength you couldn't do, but in God's strength, he's saying, yeah, jump. I dare you. What's one thing you know would take God to happen? I'll tell you the miracles God loves. One's only he can do. The miracles God loves are miracles of transformation where the only answer is God. Because then all glory goes to God. And your ministry of reconciliation is of his love. Not of your hard work, great Bible study ethic, and your understanding of how to live. It's not your morality that saves you, it's Jesus. Now, I believe this, this message was for everybody. But while praying, I also believe there were some people here today, there was a few people here who needed to hear something else. There are some people here today who, because of your own actions in the past, feel disqualified from what I'm talking about. And you'd say, yeah, thank you, Jason, nice message, whatever, um, but I'm just disqualified from some things. And, and what, what generally happens, I hear, a lot of, I hear a lot of Christians preach this, and, and it's not entirely wrong, okay? I'm, I'm not saying this is wrong, but, but here's how it goes. Um, Sin has spiritual consequences, but actions have earthly consequences. So when God forgives you, he forgives the sin consequence. You're no longer condemned by death, but you still have to live with the earthly consequences. Right? And, and so, you know, if you had a pregnancy out of wedlock, you still have the child, even if the sin consequences are gone. You know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I can make up whatever example I want to make up. And that's not wrong. Here's the thing. I don't believe God has physical limitations. And I believe there are some people here who need to realize when God says, I want to forgive you, he says, I want to redeem all of it. I want to take your worst story and I want to make it part of your amazing testimony. I want to heal even the consequences you're living with that you can find freedom. I believe God's miracles are all in miracles, not I'll dabble in the spiritual, but you're still going to be stuck in the mud and the real. I believe there are some people where for 2017, there's going to be a, a very real break for you from very real consequences to actions, either people, what things have done to you or things you've done to others, very real actions and consequences you're experiencing that God wants to redeem those if you'll trust him with it. Um, the verse that was really heavy on my heart today, I want to leave you with this morning, out of Isaiah 43, 18 to 19. It says, do not remember the, pa the past events. Pay no attention to things of old. Look, I'm about to do something new. Even now it is coming. Do you not see it? Indeed, I will make a way in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. There are some people here who are living in a desert, possibly even of your own making. And God would say to you, I want to bring rivers to your desert. I want to actually transform the landscape of your life for 2017, if, if you'll let them. You, your brain might be living in the past, but you don't have to live your life out of the past. God can do something new. I'm going to invite the band to come up here. And I'm actually going to do, I don't do this very often, but we're going to do a little call and response reading. And I want to reread this verse in the first person. I, I, I want us to own 
this verse for 2017. So I'm going to invite you to repeat after me. I will not remember the past events. I will not remember the past events. I won't pay attention to things of old. I won't pay attention to things of old. Look, God is doing something new. Look, God is doing something new. Even now it is coming. Even now it is coming. I can see it. I can see it. Indeed, God will make a way. Indeed, God will make a way. He'll make rivers in my desert. Amen. I want you to bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, I, I do believe that you're doing something new. I do believe you're making rivers in the desert. God, I believe that there are, there are people here who are hurting so bad, hurting so bad, and that they believe they need to hurt bad because of things they've done. And God, I know it is your heart to wipe the tears from their eyes, to... to straighten the bent back that's burdened under that load. God, that you are doing a transformational thing. God, I know your love isn't incremental. It is radical and transformational and amazing. And Lord Jesus, I just pray that your spirit would come upon us so mightily this morning. Lord Jesus, that we would not try to live out of an incremental New Year's resolution, try to be a good Christian, moral garbage mindset, but out of a a holy and blind trust of your loving spirit transforming us from the inside out. And dear Jesus, I just pray right now that you would cut off the things of the past that are, that are tearing down these mighty saints and men and women of faith, God. Lord Jesus, I pray you would bind the mocking mouth. Lord God, that you would shut that pit in our minds of remembrance of our sin. God, Lord Jesus, if we have sinned primarily and only against you and you've forgotten it, God, I pray that we could forget it. Lord God, I, I pray that we would just submit before you, not in ego of our purity, but in pure humility, that we'd say, Lord God, I am who you say I am, and I'll go where you send me. Do what you ask of me. Say what you need me to say. Lord God, I pray that there would be men and women who would be vessels of your spirit and that they would carry their testimonies proudly into this new year. Lord God, come now. In your precious and holy name, amen.